Today we are speaking, uh, we are going to speak about two things and hopefully also doing a little bit of exercise on those two things. Um, the first one is Express that maybe many of you, if not all of you, have already seen that in Software Engineering 1, maybe, um, the English course. And the other things that we are going to, so to do is uh, spend a little bit of time to see how we can design HTTP APIs for a server to be consumed by a client like ours hmm, that we have in React. And not to design random HTTP APIs, but let's say with some rule, with some structure, at least. Um, so, but let's start with the Express. So today, as is written here in the slides, today we are speaking about the server side. So we are moving away from React for a bit, just for this week actually, and uh, um, the front end to move back into Node.js, SQLite 3, and the server side starting from today. And the goal for, for today, and in general for the, for the server side part of this course, is to implement a relatively simple and minimal web server in JavaScript, clearly, for hosting our own content, accessing to the database, so supporting persistency of data into the database, and hosting APIs as a, a source of data, as a source of truth for our React application, so that the React application can have some persistency, can do some operation, and store data in a database somewhere, and get those information to re-render itself with components, etc., as we have already seen. So we covered the front end. We are going now to move on the back end, the server, and then next week we are starting to say to see how we can put these two things together, the front end and the back end. How we can have a front end speak with the back end and vice versa. So how, how these two entities can exchange effectively data and information. Uh, so before starting speaking about the server, we should um, speak a bit about HTTP, or maybe not, it depends. Um, so how, how, how do you feel about HTTP in general? Do you feel confident? Do you want to do a, a recap? Who knows? Oh, okay. <laughs> recap. Okay, so here there are a, a lot of slides actually on HTTP. Uh, so, well, what, what is it? But we can do also it without slides, but uh, the recap. What is HTTP? It's a protocol for, for changing data where? On the web, on the internet. Okay, um, there are methods in HTTP? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, how many? I don't remember. Which are? Get, post, put, delete, head. Okay, these are the the basic one at least, hmm? get, post, put, uh, delete, head. Then there is others like patch, but they are, say, not in the in, in, in base set, hmm? in the old-fashioned base set, set. They're more recent as a method. Uh, so we are going to use that. We are going to use these methods. We are going to create a server able to reply to get request, to post request, to put request, to delete request, essentially. We don't really need a head request in our server, in our application, but the other four, yes, they are needed. Good, uh, let me see if I lost something. Um, this is all very interesting. Um, oh, status, hmm? HTTP, and we are going to use this. HTTP as a status, 
right? Each message is a request, can have a response, we have a response with at least a status. Hmm? And these status are in the family of 1x, 2x, 3x, etc. And for instance, we have 200 that is okay. Hmm? So the request was received, at least received and processed in a good way. Uh, we have 404, not found. So the resource you are trying to access is not found. Any other status code that came to your mind? 500, that is. Interlarge server error, yes. Mm. So these are errors that we can, uh, can have. Mm. Or, uh, for instance, there is 201. The 200 is okay. 201 is success. Mm. So it's not just okay, is the message has been received. It's okay. 201 is not only the message has been received, but, it, but the, uh, the processing was successful upon the message. Or, for instance, 422. Two. Unprocessable entity, yes. So you, the server, the recipient of the HTTP message receives something that is not unprocessable, that is not processable. Mm? So it cannot continue with the processing. Still in the family of four. Mm? Uh, well, these are the full list. So one, something is informational. Two, something is around the family of okay, okay thing. 300 is a redirect, moving from one HTTP one URL to another URL. Um, 400 are client error, 500 are uh, server errors, hmm? like 500 internal server errors. Hmm? 404, not found because it's the client, the sender request, it's the front end. In our case, it, in our case it could be a reactor, the sender request to a URL that is not available on the server. And so it's not an error on the server, but it's the client that asks something to the server that is not available there. Hmm? So not, probably not server fault in, in that specific implementation at least. Um, content type. What is content type? Content type indicates the media type of the resource that is sent hmm, or returned from the um, from the pro in the protocol, hmm, so in the request and the response, and every page, every HTML page on a browser as as a content type text HTML because there are, are actually HTML pages, hmm, but you can also have other content type like application JSON when you send a JSON document via HTTP, hmm? or form data, where you send a form hmm, through, from a client to a server, and, and others. Hmm? So these are, this tell to the server, if, if the server receive a request with this content type in it, it tells the server which is the content, um, the, the type of the content, so it gives precious indication on how to um, parse those information. Because if it's an HTML page, the content will look very, very different from a plain text or from a JSON file. They will have a different structure in it. So the server needs to know hmm, which kind of content is going to receive to be able to process it. Um, and this is the body of the request. The content is the body of the request, or the, the things, the body of the response. Hmm? And this is, you know, this table summarizes when, according to the, the standards, when the request body is needed, is mandatory, when it's not needed at all, it shouldn't be there, or it may be there or not. Hmm? So for a GET request, you don't have a request body. A GET is just to a URL. Hmm? But a GET request always have a response to that request. The GET request always has a content, always has a body 
let's say, which is the element that is retrieved through the get. Uh, the head doesn't have body, nor in the request or in the response hmm, at all. The post, yes, must have a body in the request. Hmm, sometimes have a body in the response. It may or may not. It depends. Hmm? But it's also fine if they don't have a response, a body in the response. Same things for the put. And for delete uh, is basically do whatever you want because it can have a request or not. It can have a body request or not, and it can have a response in the, a body in the response or not. Typically, most of the cases, the delete doesn't have a body in the request. Because you are typically saying, I would like to delete, delete that resource. And you are not really needed to specify any other detail, but by the standard, you can choose to have a body if needed. So typically, again, it doesn't have a body in the request, but it, the, the method in the protocol allows it. Differently from get, that instead say you must not have a body in the request of a get um, message. Um, and this is the short recap on HTTP, at least for what we need to use in the protocol. So we are going to use HTTP. We all already using HTTP. When you type uh, an address on your browser, what happens when you type an address on your browser from an HTTP perspective? You get, uh, you get a GET request. You're performing a GET request to a specific URL. And then again, a GET request without a body in the request, but with a body in the response. And the response, which, which is the, what is the body of the response? in that to get the web page. The web page. Hmm. When you do a post in the in the browser, in your daily life. When you insert information sometime, yes. Uh, a more well, well. specific example in the login in the login. Every time you log in, it's typically a post. Um, and browsers are able to natively end post and get request. They need JavaScript for the delete. That is a fundamental um, information to have, right? So for get and post, the browser is able to, to process them. Clearly, we, we do get every time we open a browser. So, but the delete is supported, but not, let's say, natively from a browser. It needs to be done through JavaScript hmm, to work. Then clearly, it supports it, because otherwise uh, doesn't, um, doesn't work if, it, if it's not supported. But the two things that are supported natively by HTML, let's say, are get and post. Uh, so express now. So why we need HTTP? Because we are going to create some endpoint, some URL in our server so that a client can call those URL with a specific method, with a specific request body and get back a response in the body. So we are going to operate Let's say we are not going to write the HTTP protocol by hand, but under, under, under the, the hood, there is the HTTP protocol working. Mm. Uh, so have you seen experts in software engineering? How many of you do software engineering in English? OK, have you seen experts in software engineering briefly, right? For testing, what is more or less? Five slides. Oh, here there is not much more than five slides, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so complex, you know, Express. Mm. But except the five slides, um, that, you know, it doesn't really mean the number of slides. Um, which you know about Express? Which you what do what you remember about Express? The one that already did, then we, we, we put. 
we, you just implemented APIs. We were going, to, we're going to do the same. We're going to implement APIs. So nothing really strange, but concept like middleware. No. But I bet you're going to use a middleware also there, but maybe you, you, did, you haven't called it with that name. Um, so no middleware. Um, okay, no matter. Uh, so what is Express? Express is a web framework in Node for, um, well, for creating server. Actually, also for creating, uh, let's say, old-fashioned web applications. Hmm? So not the single-page application like we have in React, but the multi-page application provided by a server. So the typical classic application in which every request from a browser is a different page provided by the server. So experts support both. This way of working can provide APIs, can provide HTML pages for each request. But the mechanism is more or less the same. You define some URL. And when that URL is called by a browser, by another, by a mobile application, by whatever, when something call that HTTP uh, method, hmm, that call that, that URL with a specific HTTP method, then something happened and something is returned, being it an HTML page or being it a JSON file or being it a plain text or other things. A resource with a get is returned in any case. Hmm? So Node, uh, even if it's Node started for the web, hmm, actually, uh, doesn't have really a lot of support for HTTP. It has a module, Node, natively, called HTTP that will allow you to activate a web server, that will allow you to manipulate HTTP messages, request responses, but in a very low level. So you're going to specify the header, the messages, all by hand. This is not very practical. So Express uh, is one of the most popular web framework, modular web framework in, um, for Node.js. It's not the only one, but it's one of the, of, the, of the most popular. So you see here there is uh, a few others, web frameworks uh, in Nodes. Uh, but again, Express is one of the most popular. It's also quite simple to, to use, not very, not very difficult. So how it works? Well, you install, you create a new node project with an NPM in it, as we did weeks ago. Uh, then you can install Express, like we installed SQLite 3, DJS, etc. And then you can create a file, .js, and you can execute it with node, the name of the file be it index.js or server.js or whatever you want to call it, .js. Um, so basically what we did in the first weeks of the course, but with the server. And there are a few lines that are, let's say, mandatory in index.js or in the main file that could be, that typically are, in the main file of the server. Um, and the command to running the server will start the server application. And it will have the server running until the application crash or you interrupt the server manually. Uh, and if you modify a file natively, that change is not taken into consideration until you again stop the server and restart it. Hmm? Uh, so we, to avoid this, because we are going to run a server and then modify something, and every time stopping, restarting, stopping, restarting is very, very boring, and also maybe you forget to stop it. Hmm? We are going to use Nodemon that is written here in this orange box. Hmm? So Nodemon is another Node.js uh, package that you install with NPM, essentially, uh, that monitors any change on JavaScript file in a project and restart the process, the node process, if a file is modified. Hmm? So instead of writing node, the, the file of the server, 
uh, on node mode is installed, and this minus G means install it at the global level, mm, not per project, but for the entire operating system. And you call it node mode, the, the name of the server, that file is monitored. So every time you change, in this case, index.js, Nodemon uh, knows it and restarts the server for you automatically. So this is very handy in developing things. So which are the first steps with Express? So this is the bare minimum Express server application that you can create. So you first of all need to import Express as a library. So const Express, let's say, or require Express the library. Then you have to create the application. Uh, what means create application? Create application means calling, let's say, the constructor of Express, storing it in an object, let's say app in this case, and from that object, you have access to all a series of methods that Express allow you to use. For instance, here is app.get. What is app.get to you? What it does? Reply to a get request. Yes. So this line here, what it does? It's a, it's a, when I receive, when the server receive a get request, so this get is the get, is the method get of HTTP. At this specific URL, that is the root URL. So let's say localhost something slash that, that level here do whatever is in the body of this function. This is a function, you see, this is a narrow function. Actually, this is a callback, this is a narrow function. So when you see a get to this root, send a response that contains a string that is hello world. So if we copy and paste this in, not in Visual Studio Code and run this, when we say localhost, whatever it is, slash, we see on the web browser, what we see on the web browser, if we, hello world, hmm? the string. But then the browser, notice that this is a string. This is not an HTML page. Because it's not written as HTML, right? There is no HTML tag or anything else. It's just a string. But the browser is, let's say, smart enough to be able to handle plain text and put it inside a very simple HTML template, default template. And then, so here we defined one URL, one API that in the Express Jergo is called a root. Hmm? This is a root. And a root is made by a URL and a method. Always this pair of things. Hmm? You can have the same URL with different methods and different behavior, clearly. Hmm? So you can have a get on the root like this, but you, you can also have a post on the same URL, for instance. Hmm? And they will have different behavior. Uh, what else we see here? What is the REC and REST to you? It's, they are the object that contains the JavaScript, and the JavaScript object that contains the representation of the HTTP request and the HTTP response. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if clearly this is something that is called by a client, request contains the request that is received to the server, and the response, it's already there, available as an object with some methods, and it's the container for the response you are going to send back to the client. So while the request is filled with all the information received, that, that the, the server receive, so you can typically read it to get the information you need, the response is the thing that you send back. So it's pre-filled with some 
basic information for you, allow you to have some methods like send, that allow you to send a response back, but they already feel that. And this is the, the normal way to define roots in Express. App dot name of the method, name of the HTTP method, URL, rec response, arrow function with the rec response as parameter, and then the body of that function. So what do you want the root to do? In this case, again, returning a word. So here we just have one root, but you can have 10, 11, 100, whatever root you need. And then in the end, in the end of the document, you activate the server. So up to this point, it's just defining things. I'm creating the constructor, the app, from Express as a function. I'm defining all the roots, and at a certain point I need to, to say, okay, I'm going to listen to open the, to create the, to run the server and listen to a specific port of the server. And this is what the last line does. This last line launch the server. And say that re, uh, Express should listen to incoming requests from 3000 as the port. Hmm? So in this case is localhost, column 3000, and then the rest of the URL. Hmm? And this app listen, you see it's similar to the root. Hmm? There is the method, there is a one parameter, and then there is an arrow function, a callback. And also app listen as a callback, that is what happens when you launch the server. That is typically a message to say the server is ready. When you see the message the server is ready, means that the server is able from that moment on to process the incoming request. So this is to activate the server and put it running for all the incoming requests. Um, okay, this is what, what I already said, app has all the methods for HTTP. So app.get will give you a get request. App.post, app.put, app.delete. You have all of them, and the structure is always the same. Uh, if you want to catch, it's not really maybe common in our case, but it's a possibility. If you want to catch all the type of request once, uh, you can also have app.all. Mm? So app.get will catch the get request from a specific URL. App.all will catch all the possible type of request to that specific URL mm? as a unique endpoint. Um, and then there is the path that is the part, the, the relative URL, let's say, and the handler that is the arrow function for request and um, and responses. So, which properties does request a response object as? Uh, quite a few, actually, but the most the important that we're going to use often are the one in circle. So for the request, there is a property, not a method, a property that's called the body. And you expect that the property called body will have inside Not a JSON ob not necessarily a JSON object, but the body of the request, whatever it is. So if the if the request is coming in XML, you will have XML there. If it comes in plain text, you will have plain text. This is just a property to say get me, give me the body of the request as a JSON object, as a JavaScript object. It doesn't specify which is the type of that request of the body in this property. We will have to. Uh, there is also a property dot method that gives you the method mm, uh, if you need it from the request because clearly the request has all this information. Uh, any parameter coming from the request and a dot query that is an object containing all the query strings used in the request. Mm. And 
Instead, the response doesn't have a lot of properties, but has useful method. And we already have seen one that is send uh, for sending, that is here, for sending a response. But there are other three that are um, important, uh, especially two actually. One is rest.json hmm? that send a request, like the send method, but not of a generic type like send, in which we send a string, whatever as in that string, but send a JSON, send a JSON. Take a JSON object, a JavaScript serialization of a JSON object, and send it as a string, clearly, because the browser needs to receive a document formatted as text, not as JavaScript object, hmm? because it goes into HTTP. Uh, and then the other one is rest.and. Rest.and and the response process. So if you don't want, or you cannot send back a response with a body, but just a response like 200 okay, or 404 not found, or something like that, on set up the status, you can say, okay, I'm sending back the response with an empty body. So and send back an empty body, send the response with an empty body while send and JSON send back a body in the response and end the response process accordingly. Um, and then there is also another property uh, that I don't see here in the response that is for setting the, sta the status. And so you can also set the status to 400 and then send a body or then send the end, etc. Uh, and then there is also the redirect for redirecting our request. Um, here you are, rest.status. And you just type the name, the number of the status. So if you want to send a 200, is rest.status 200.end. Uh, actually also uh, .send or .end. It depends if you, if you need to send something. Uh, actually, rest.end will send a 200 without specifying it by default. Uh, but if you want to change it, like to send a 404, uh, 500, other code, you can write a rest.status, the status you want to send, dot end. If it doesn't have a body, dot send something if you want to send a body, dot JSON if you want to send a JSON. And you can concatenate that, like it's written here. Um, I mentioned J JSON a few times. Do you know what, what is, right? Yes, no? All of you? How many of you doesn't have any idea what is JSON? Okay, good. Um, what is JSON? That is the name, a JavaScript object uh, notation. But doesn't uh, uh, answer the, the question. How, how is made? What can you write in it? It's like a JavaScript object. I'm uh, repeating for, for people watching later. Um, so it's ja like a JavaScript object, um, a serialization, a string serialization of a JavaScript object in which you can use all the things that you use in JavaScript as a format to describe um, some content, let's say. Do you agree with this more or less definition? No, yes, yes. Um, so the, the rest.json mm, send pick a JavaScript object mm, and serialize it into the corresponding JSON. So you can, in JSON, send directly the JavaScript version, a JavaScript object, a JavaScript variable with something in it, and this method we try to convert it into JSON, mm, into the string version, let's say, of JSON, in the, in the notation, in, Java, in the JSON notation. Um, so you don't have to convert it manually. You just pass the object and this method will try to convert whatever is possible. 
Um, middlewares. Um, so middlewares are functions. Uh, function that are called for, let's say, every request. By default, every request. But you can also, but well, it doesn't matter. Every request. You can also specify that they work only for some kind of request. But let's say that the most common, the most common usage is for every request. So something that you want to execute every single time you receive a request, not just once not just when you receive a get on a specific URL. You want this to happen every time, or often at least. Uh, so there are actually functions that you can define, or that others can define, or that Express actually defines some middlewares. Uh, so before, uh, your colleague here was saying that send, uh, was send, I don't remember, what uh, send a JSON object back. It didn't, uh, so a request contains a JSON, a JSON object in the body. Mm? Uh, and I told you, no, the body is just the body, whatever it is in the body. We need to specify if in the body there is a JSON object, if there is an HTML object, if there is a plain text object, whatever, what is this body? Mm? We don't know. So if we know, if the developer creating the server know that every request is a JSON object, can you use a middleware that specify that is already done by Express, actually, so you don't have to write anything except I want to use it, that specify that every request, every body in the request is a JSON object. So that when you use rec.body, that object coming out from rec.body is serialized, deserialized from JSON into a JavaScript object corresponding to that. So that every request knows that the request coming, the body of the request, is a JSON object, contains a JSON object. So this is a middleware, a function that you use for every request, or for very, very a lot of requests, in a general way. So you don't have to specify for every single method, oh, I want to do this. Because you specify at a global level. You, I want to do this for everything, or for, again, a lot of things. Uh, so, middlewares can be defined or can be used. We're going to use them, uh, a few of them, three or four of them uh, in the course. Um, but you can also define that. And they are function. They are function, and I'm going to tell you this because we are going to see this function at a certain point. Uh, they are function that has a request object, a response object, like a root, but they also have a third parameter. You see there? Next. Hmm. So a middleware receives the request and the response. Typically before the roots, hmm. before app.get, let's say. But they also have a third parameter that is a method that is a function that is next, that needs to be called in the body of the middleware, let's say to this function, OK, I am done. Now call the next one. And this next one could be another middleware or could be a root. So let's imagine that you receive a GET request to a specific URL that your, that your server is handling. And that request contains a, a JSON object. And you are going to write a middleware for JSON because you don't want to use it, the, the one that you, uh, the, the, the Express put it in, uh, met, makes available for you. So you are going to write a function like this called endlejson, for instance. Uh, you get the request object in the body of the function. You extract the body. You do something in the body to have a JSON object. You reput, let's say, the JSON object defined that way into the body, the parsed, the JavaScript version of, of the body into the body, into a request again, and then you call next. What is this next? This next could be another middleware in the chain, or 
If you don't have any other middleware defined or in use, it's the root, the root that should handle the get request that you have made in the first place. Mm? So the middleware is something that is putting in the middle between the message received from, by, from a client to a server and the root that handles that message. So again, it's something in the middle. Uh, and you can define a middleware for the entire application, like for JSON, um, for instance, with app.use here. Um, so when you write app.use express.json, you are telling your express application that every request has a JSON body. Uh, and this is a middleware. Uh, or and or you can activate a middleware on specific routes. And you do it in the app dot method, app dot get, app dot post, in which I told you that app dot something as the path and as the arrow function with the request or response, but it can also have something in the middle. Again, that is a callback to the middleware. So if you want to activate a middleware on a specific function only, on a specific method only, you will have the path, you will have the callback, you will have the function implementing the, the middleware, and then you have the arrow function. And so here is even more visible this next thing, because this is called, and then the next will bring you to the next function that is actually the processing of the method, of the root. Mm. So what do you want to do when you receive a get, a post, that specific get, post, put, whatever. Uh, okay, here there is an example of a middleware that we are not going to use it a lot. Uh, that is express.static. Mm. Uh, app use express.static, public, say that every static resource images, j j CSS file, etc., is served from a specific folder that is public. It's a middleware, you put it in the middle before processing any other things. Uh, then, parameters. Uh, if you have parameters on the URL, like this one, so URL is login. And then you have two parameters, right? Which are these two parameters? Yes. Oh, the static middleware. Uh, if you need to register to, to record two things about the static middleware, is one, we are not going to use it. And two, uh, it's a middleware that is made for uh, serving all the static content. So instead of oh, every time you, you need a kitten.jpg uh, uh, image to be put back and seeing the full path of that image in your server, you can say all these static things happen to be in a folder that's called public. So if I say I want something that is static, that is an image, I, I would like to have kitten.jpg the server is going to look in, the, in that folder automatically without you to have to specify oh, it's in the public folder or in this or in that. It's a simplification for, for telling Express where the static content is, okay? We're not going to use it a lot because we are providing APIs with JSON text, and so we are not going to give back images or CSS file. But Express support this for, as I told you before, the the standard, the old glory web application in which you have multiple pages served all by a server. So in this way, you need the server to provide images, CSS, JavaScript file, HTML file, and some of them are actually static content, like CSS is static. You write that and you don't manipulate it anymore on written. okay? Uh, we are with, we're speaking about query parameters. Um, so, first line, which is the URL? What is the URL here? Login. 
uh, which parameter, uh, how many parameter has this um, URL? Two. How they are named? User and pass. And which is the value? FC and one, two, three. Okay. And you can get in Express this parameter. You will define uh, in Express, you are going to define for this app.get path slash login because they are parameter. And then in the request, any parameter is contained in the query property. So the query property will give all the parameters, uh, but Express also parse them. So in the query.user, you will have the content of the user parameter. In the query.pass, you will have the content of the pass parameter. And Express is able to understand clearly how it's named the parameter and create a property accordingly. So here it's user, so you have a query.user automatically. Here is pass, and you have a query.pass. But whatever the name you want to put it on the parameter, you will have a query dot that name as property for accessing the content of the parameter. So if you need to use that. And you don't need any middleware to use parameters. You can just use them. Uh, for forms, or for APIs actually, like um, the one with JSON, so post, put, post and put, uh, you want to access the body of the request. So request.body will give you the body, the full body as an object. Uh, but again, Express does the same things if the, uh, for instance, if it's a JSON, let's have a look at the last line. If it's a JSON, so you are enabling the Express.json middleware, every body is expected to be a JSON, so it's automatically convert from JSON text to uh, a JavaScript object representing that content. And so in this body, you will have the full JSON. But if you have a JSON like this, with user and pass like before, as before, you will have a user dot, a body dot user to get the first element in the JSON here, and body dot pass to get the other key, let's say, in that object. Express in doing the same things that was doing for parameters, give you access to specific entities inside a JavaScript object, if you want it. If you know that you are just needed one element there, or if you need it to check. Hmm? Maybe the first one of these is called error. So maybe before processing the request, you want to check if this field error is, has something in it. So you can say, you can say if rec.body.error is equal to something, then return an error. Otherwise, I'm going to continue with the processing. So this is a use case for accessing directly to a specific portion of the body. Uh, well, path, path, so URL, you can have all the you can make it as complex as you want, essentially. And so you can have a single path. You can have a regular expression in path uh, in various format. Uh, you can also have arrays in the path. Mm? That is, this a get request, this specific method, this specific route, does not only apply to the route to the URL ABCD, but also to X, Y, Z, A, Z, A but also this one with regular expression, but also, hmm, so a single callback, a single route that may apply to different URL, if needed. It's not very often needed, but sometimes it may be. Hmm. The, the most common things that we're going to use is simple path. Hmm. Or simple path with parameters, hmm. not query parameters. But let's say JavaScript parameters, um, like this one. Users slash column 
something, in this case user ID, slash books, slash colon, book ID. These are parameters for Express. What does they mean? They mean that if you have a URL like this, users 34 books 8989, you will get this URL because these are wildcard, user ID and book ID. And that in this case, we'll, in this case we'll get 34 and 8989 as wildcard, as content. But if you have users 11 and books 14, given that these are parameters, the same methods will be called. So you are going to process everything, even if these are variable numbers that can change. So these are parameters for the root. I want to process this always in the same way. But the user ID could be a number between 1 and 1,000, so you're not going to create 1,000 identical root. You're going to parameterize the things that can change frequently, and you don't know how much they will change, how many they are. Like a user ID. It depends on how many users you have. Or books. It depends how many books you have. It could be three, it could be one million. You don't know at the beginning. Maybe they can be added in the process, deleted. So this needs to be variable. Um, and again, and they are available in always in the request object, but in dot parameters. Rex.params dot user ID is the parameter named user ID, and book ID is the parameter named book ID. Um, finally, a middleware that we are going to use that is called Morgan, uh, that is a login middleware. Because actually, Express by default does not log anything. It's very, very quiet, very, very silent. Uh, but we, we need to know especially when developing some logging feature, like, oh, there is an error, there is an exception, there is something that happens, or this request went well or not. So we need a little bit of logging. And so Morgan, as a middleware, Morgan is an NPM package. So you install it, NPM install Morgan. Uh, but it's also middleware for Express. So for instance, writing, after importing it, writing app.use morgan dev will enable logging for the entire, since it's a middleware, and it's defined this way, we will, uh, will enable logging for the entire application. So whatever things uh, Express does, it will be log. And this dev here is, let's say, the logging level the login profile. Dev is a login profile for development. And so it gives you the information, the useful information at the development level. You can have also, for instance, info that will give you every single thing that happened, even if uh, a request went well. So all, all the information that you may have from logging. So there is a few of them to, to be chosen from. Dev is the one um, especially fought for developing. Mm. So we give you a series of details also according to the HTTP request received. But we are going to see it in a moment. Uh, and, uh, well, there are a lot of middlewares. That's not really uh, important right now. One middleware that we are going to use is this one called Passport. You may be Still uh, already have encountered it? No? Uh, not yet in uh, software engineering? No. Passport is for login, creating login, login in, login in, the login process on the server. Mm. So it's a middleware for authentication, actually. And it supports a lot of authentication strategies, from the classical username and password to 
OAuth, to OpenID, to whatever. Mm? There is extendable modular for supporting a lot of authentication strategies in a server. Mm? And we are going to use it the very last week of the course with username and password for enabling login from React to Express and vice versa. Uh, the last middleware we're going to see, just to mention, uh, it's actually a middleware for validating inputs. So validating the things that are in the request. So let's imagine to a form like the one you have in the lab in which you want to create movies. Maybe you want to check if some, to check one more time in the server if the title of the movie is present, is valid, if the is favorite is in the proper format, like true or false, etc. So you can perform a series of check before adding this element, let's say, in a, in a database. Mm -hmm. And these are check that this middleware allow you to have in a sort of automatic way. In this, you see where they are, this check. They are after the URL, before the request response function, where the callback of a middleware is, I told you before, but here, notice that they're written as an array. So it's an array that it will be parsed by this express validator. It's an array that will allow you to perform some check. So check username means that there is in the, response, in the request body a field called the username, and you want to check that this field that's called the username is an email. And if it's not, you will have errors here in these validation results. Same things, you can check the password as a minimum length of five. Hmm? So you can double check, validate things, hmm? at least the most important things. And validation, I told you that is important on the client, but it's even more important on the server because you are going to manipulate data in a persistent way. You're going to save this data. So if this data is corrupted, you're going to corrupt your database in a way. Or you're going to generate errors in your database while inserting things in it. So it's always, especially in this case for username and password, it's always good to check if things are validated correctly. Okay, any other, any question on this? No? Okay, before having a break, let me say two things about APIs. What is an API? Okay, not what is the, what does it mean? What is an API? It's an application programming interface, but it could be also alphabetical people interacting for our purpose. What is, what do you use it for? It's the prototype of function. It's a collection of function. It's an interface between two different layers. Which layers? For, for example, yeah. It's, it's, that's correct. It's an interface between two layers. There could be one model and another, a database and an application. Or in our case, given that they are HTTP APIs, are URL with a method. It's an interface between the client and the server. What the server provides in terms of routes, the routes that we have mentioned before, to any client. 
which could be this client? A React application can be a client? Yes or no? Yes. Why not? Um, uh, JavaScript application like we did in the first weeks with DOM manipulation, etc., could be, if we have a method to call a, a, a server, could be a client? Yes. What else could be a client? A mobile application could be a client. What else? The browser in general could be a client. At least one. Yes, we, we, can, we can act, this is HTTP API, so yeah, we, we can call them for testing, so we can also have some program to, to test them, so uh, that is another kind of client, simple th than this. Also another server, could be a client, yes, could act as a client, it's a server calling the APIs to another server, well, let's imagine you, you need from your server to get weather forecasting, let's say. No, you're not going to, money to create a weather forecasting on your own. You're going to access a weather forecasting application to give you the weather forecasting. So you or your server, let's say, is acting as a client for another server. Yes, absolutely. Also, a desktop application could be a client. No? Not only a mobile application. So Visual Studio Code, for instance, could be a client for or Slack could be a client for some APIs on the server. It is, probably. Because it doesn't work without the internet, so. Yes, also equipment, yeah, could be. Okay, so in our case is the glue between client and server, so it's this interface we put in the middle between the layer Database, other services like weather forecasting, Bors Exchange, etc., and um, the application, whatever it is, the application. And we are going to say that the APIs are URL in the server, like routes, and the application sends information in JSON. This is not mandatory. You, you can also send information in other, encode it in another type, but currently, nowadays, JSON is the, the favorite format to send information in this, uh, in this way. And so we're going to, to stack with 2021, 2022, uh, the 2022 word. Uh, you know already what is JSON, so I'm going to skip all of this. Uh, you have in JavaScript two methods explicitly, if you need explicitly to create a JSON, a JSON object, either from a string or to a string, you have the stringify, json.stringify, and this is in JavaScript, plain JavaScript. Uh, json.stringify converts a, Java, a, J, a JavaScript object into JSON, into a JSON string, recursively. So if you have an array of object that contains array, that contains object that contains array, it tries to do all the work for you. Um, and json.parse do the opposite. Given a string in the JSON format, will give you a JavaScript object representing that JSON. Hmm? Um, okay. So we are going to see um, we have said that we have URL. We're going to use HTTP methods, and we are going to use JSON. How can we create reasonable APIs? We are not going to follow any specific um, methodology. Um, there are, for instance, there are REST API. Any of you already heard the REST? some other courses no yes we are not going to to be strict on that hmm? we're not going to create exactly rest apis hmm? but this is sort of inspired for them to give some structure to our apis because the apis could be also slash a random name but then you we need to to have some sort of 
coherence and let's say good practice so that we can recognize how an APIs work and also a person that is using your APIs can have some patterns and say, okay, if all the users are getting with the slash users API, maybe all the books are getting with the slash books API. So it doesn't have too many changes to follow neither you, neither the person that's using the, um, the APIs for something. So we have two main types of URI. We want to have two main types of API, the collection and the element. The collection is something that represents a set or list of objects, like all the students, all the courses, all the books, all the movies, all the exams, a collection. So if we have this URL here as an endpoint, api.polito.it, then slash students will represent the set of students. If we want a single element, we're going to add it after the collection. So slash student slash s12345 six is one specific student identified in a unique way with their ID within that collection of students. So we have again collections something slash students slash course slash books and elements that are after a collection hmm? to identify an element a specific element within that collection and we're going to structure our apis in this way we identify a collection we identify an element within the collection if we need to identify a single element in, within the collection uh, best practice for definition let's use noun not verb. Students, books, bookings, etc. not verb. Collectional, plural, because they are many things. And let's try to use concrete name for readability. So courses, not items, objects, things. But let's be specific and concrete. Uh, the server with an API should support these and many other methods. Operation, add, delete, update, find, get, etc. And these operations are mapped onto the HTTP method. So when you want to retrieve information, either from an entire collection or a single collection, we're going to use we're going to use get, because we, we want to retrieve something. So we're going to get something. That's reasonable. When we want to create a new element, we want to create a new student in our collection of students, we're going to use post. That's good. If we want to update that user, that student, put, and the easiest one, if you want to delete, delete. Mm -hmm. And these are the operation, where these operations are happening. So the get can happen for collection or single element. It depends. Do you want the entire set of exams? Get exams. Do you want a single exam? Get exams slash the code of the exam, 0, 1, A, B, C, D. If you want to create a new exam in the collection, because you pass an exam, you are going to use, we said, a post to the collection, not to the single element. We don't have the single element. We're going to create a single element. We're going to add the exam 01 RBC to the collection of the exams. So the URL, the API go to the collection always to the collection, never to a single element for a post. Uh, and this is similar, very, very similar to REST, if you already have seen that. Uh, put. If we are going to update an exam, 
which is the URL we are going to use. Collection and a single exam to be updated, so slash exams slash 01 ABC. Um, can we, uh, delete is delete. Uh, can we update all the exams at once? Can we, then we can ask, should we, but can we? Yes, we can, absolutely. Should we? Probably not, exactly. So the put updating, we update one thing at a time. We are not going to update a collection. We are not going to design APIs for updating a collection. It's technically possible, why not? But it's better not to to not get in trouble, because we're going to update a very large set, possibly. Um, and then I have another qu interesting question for you on this, delete. We are going to delete a collection or a single element at a time. A single element. We are not going to allow a client to delete an entire collection of things because mistakes can happen, and if a, a client forget to write the ID and just write delete to the collection, you are going to remove all the elements in your collection. And so if you have a server that is actually served by, queried by 11 clients, that could be because a server is made for serving multiple clients, not just one, we will have always one, but in the reality, you have a server serving a lot of clients. You don't want to have really dangerous operation to be happen by default without very, very careful checks. And so deleting a collection is something very, very bad if it happens by mistake. Because then you have to recover, let's say, maybe 1,000 elements. So it's better in this case to give a little bit more burden to the, to the client to say, okay, you want to delete five things? Well, tell me which are this specific these five things to delete, not all of them, hmm? not the entire collection. Hmm? So this table um, summarize what we said. Hmm? So a get works for, we are going to write gets for getting the entire collection and getting the single element. We're going to write post for, get, for creating a new element into a collection. So we not have a post to a single element. Vice versa, we will have a put only on single elements and delete only on single elements. Hmm? We can have a put also and a delete on, only also on a collection. It's not that we cannot, uh, but we shouldn't really hmm? uh, for sanity. So here there is an example with written avoid, but just to, to make it clear. Um, and here there is another set of um, names. So typically when you want to get a collection in your, um, you, s you don't write get as plain text or as a method in your code, you write list something. If you want to get a single element to get something, if you want to add something, create something. So create exam, create movie. This is best practice. Nothing, not, nothing really written on the stone, but just how things are in many, many API, real world APIs. So this is, for instance, taken by the Google APIs, for which all day, in, in a given moment in time, all the APIs for listing, getting a collection is list something, list places, list location, list X. For create something, create, not add, but create exam, create location, create place, etc. So again, best practice. Um, then we can have a relationship, collection, single element, and then we can have another collection because maybe we want to connect uh, courses to a specific student or student to specific course. Hmm? So we can get all the courses followed by 
the student identify with this ID. Or all the students enrolled to this very specific course. So we are creating a relationship in our APIs. Not only give me all the courses, not only give me the details of this specific course, but also give me all the students in this specific course. And we are creating an, a relationship between elements or between collections. Uh, yes, we can uh, use parameters if needed. Maybe for searching, it's, it's fine to use parameters for searching something. Um, and we also use, as I mentioned before, HTTP status code with a message in the body to better specify what this does. Um, so if you are curious, you can also have a look at this document by Google that further explain, um, that this is the design guide by the, for the Google APIs that further explains how to create uh, good APIs. Mm -hmm. So this is, from this moment on, is out of the, let's say, scope of the course because we don't want to get too much dive in. APIs creation because it's a server thing, so we are mostly focusing on the, on the client, but still we need to design a few APIs and so let's make it in a reasonable way at least. Mm? So if you want to, to explore more, feel free to, it's not a problem, clearly. Um, okay, and here there is uh, how to do it in, 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 uh, in Express, but we are going to do it now, so we don't, we, it, but basically they are, Roots, we are going to create roots. And for testing the APIs, since we don't have a client already, in this moment, we, you can use many uh, tools, but there is a Visual Studio Code extension that's called REST Client that is very handy to test APIs. So we, we are going also to use this. Uh, if you want to install, just look for REST Client in the Visual Studio Code extension, and we're going to use it uh, after. So before having the break, one question for you, and then we are going we're having 15 minutes of break. Um, so let's go back here. Um, let's say that we're, we, we have our movies. Uh, you, you have movies uh, in your application. And movies has some properties, right? There's the name, uh, the favorite, no, it's not the favorite, is, it's a favorite? Yes, it's a favorite, it's the ranking, and it's the date watched, right? Yeah. This fourth thing. So let's say that you want to update a movie. Hmm? Uh, totally, entirely. So except of the ID of the movie, whatever it is, um, you want to update the movie entirely. Or you want to update the movie partially. So let's say just the date, or just the favorite, or just the rating, but not all the other things. Are you going to use a single endpoint to do that, or two? With put, or not? You need to use get. Did you say get? No. Because for updating, we use, we use get we use for retrieving information. So we're not going to use get for updating. Well, get for getting the information for sure, and then we can use put for changing. OK, yeah, we're going to put for changing. Do you agree we're going to use put for changing? Yes. One root or two you root? One for both partial and entire update or two? One for partial and one for entire updates? One. One and then inside you end all the difference? Okay, yes, that is really reasonable. Um, so 
Tata Bete and for working from page and just passing the old information to the new. Yes, yes, in code you are going to merge the existing information with the, the old one. The, sorry, the existing information with the new one. Um, yes, so actually this is, this is fine. You can do this. Uh, but this is actually to, to specify one thing, uh, that all these properties, all this method, should work on the entire resource. That means when you get something, you get the entire resource. Not a portion of it, just the entire. So all, the entire movie. When you post something, you create the entire movie. When you delete, you delete the entire movie, not just one property of the movie. So in theory, and that's just only a theory, uh, with put, uh, you should do the same. You should always update the entire element. That means that if you want to follow, to be very, very strict, and then in practice, nobody is so strict. But if you want to be very, very strict and compliant, let's say, with the, the theoretical standard, the client should always send the entire resource to be updated, even if you just update the date. Hmm? So the server, to be compliant, should receive an entire resource to be updated, even if, again, you just change the favorite from true and false. So this is, to be again, to be compliant because these methods act on the entire resource, not on a portion of it. Then in practice, this doesn't happen because you are not going to send from a client to server a very long object just to change one thing from true to false. But again, put should be for updating the entire resources and there is another method to do a partial update. Do you know which one? Patch. Hmm? There is an HTTP method that is, uh, say, recent, more recent, that's called patch. Hmm? That is for patching a resource, so a partial update of a resource. Hmm? We are not going to use patch. You are not required to use patch it's fine to use put and do a partial update. But just for you to know that exists, patch exists, and if you find it also some, on some APIs, so for instance, the GitHub APIs use patches, use patch for partial updates. Hmm? Uh, so just to, to tell you this, this different this, uh, thing. Then again, a partial update with put is, is fine if you need to, to do that. From, from a client to server. So it's fine to just send a partial information from the client to the server. Okay, 15 minutes of a break now.